Hello everybody, this is Gabriel Palmer, and today I'm going to be talking about some thoughts on the non-functional challenges in cell 4. And the idea behind this is effectively that cell 4 is an amazing system because of its formal verification properties. And these mean that the functional properties within the kernel and within some of the surrounding system um, are formally verified. And they've actually gone so far as to actually look at some of the timing properties of the system as well and compute a worst case execution time and show that there is a worst case execution time of the kernel. So in terms of the functional properties of the system, it has exceedingly strong things to say. And in terms of some of the non-functional, it also has strong arguments. I'm going to be focusing on some of the non-functional goals of systems and to talk about how they are looked at in cell 4, in other L4 variants, and in other related systems. So non-functional goals include things like timing and predictability, how different tasks behave within the system in terms of whether they have bounded execution, whether they can compute execution by some fixed um, amount of time, by some deadline, etc. They could refer to things like rate allocations. Is the CPU scheduling within the system abiding by certain properties? Are these non-functional goals being made? The scalability within the system. Is a scalable application scalable when implanted onto a given system with a given kernel? Um, performance. Are we actually getting the performance that we want within the system? Etc. So I'm going to be focusing on non-functional goals in general, and I'm going to be looking at the composability of the system with respect to these non-functional goals. So the idea here is that if we create functional dependencies between multiple protection domains, are the non-functional constraints impacted? So if we're looking at the end-to-end -end predictability of the system as one of the main things that we're focusing on providing, um, what impacts that? And if we add synchronous IPC between different um, protection domains within the system, are we maintaining those predictability properties that we desire? So this involves things like the scheduling policy, ensuring bounded execution of all the client tasks within the system, etc. We're also going to be talking very briefly about the end-to-end -end scalability of the system, and this effectively boils down to whether the kernel has an impact on Thread's operations, and whether that can be used for bad things or for good things. I'm going to start out by talking about the end-to-end -end predictability within the system, and I'm actually going to paint this with a historical brush. So. I'm going to paint this on a spectrum between synchronous rendezvous between threads and a notion of thread migration that a lot of different systems have been moving towards. And I'm going to be looking at a number of historical systems on this spectrum, all the way from Leica's L4, which was a kind of original L4 variant um, that basically pioneered fast IPC for microkernels, all the way up to composite that focuses entirely on thread migration. And I'm going to look at some L4 variants, Fiasco L4, Nova, which was an L4 variant focusing on hypervisors, um, and of course Cell4 with the MCS extension, somewhere in between. And the kind of high-level takeaways here are that we know that the synchronous IPC between threads is very fast. That's been shown since, you know, 93. So we, there's a long history of it being a sound structuring technique for efficient microkernels. But a implication of it is that a lot of the blocking and synchronization facilities are actually defined by the kernel. And we start to see that as we look for non-functional properties in terms of predictability within the system, that can start to intrude. Thread migration, on the other hand, is very policy independent. You have to define your blocking, synchronization, and scheduling policies at user level. Um, but it imposes something um, that is undesirable in a lot of systems that require formal verification which is a server concurrency within the system. At least it imposes it by default. So we're going to be looking at this diagram a lot in the system. This is two clients depending on one synchronous invocation endpoint of one server, that server depending on another server. And I'm going to pretend like all of these systems are using a capability-based model, even though the original L4 didn't, simply for um, simplicity. So the big question here is if each of these threads have a different priority, PS, PC1, PC0, what should those priorities actually be? So you actually need to make this type of a priority assignment in these systems as that greatly impacts the end-to-end -end predictability and execution properties of each of the threads within the system.
And one way to do it is essentially just to take the maximum priority of any of the clients, add one to it, and assign that to any server's priority. So you're essentially taking the ceiling of any of the priorities, of all of the client priorities that could depend on this um, server. So this is relatively straightforward. This has a huge benefit that the service will run at the, the top priority of any of them. Therefore, it will have essentially the same execution properties as any of them with respect to other threads interfering with it. Um, but the downside is that it's relatively pessimistic. So we might have a thread that does not depend on any of these threads within the system, on any of these services or whatnot, and it might get some impact from, it might get some interference from one of the servers simply because one of the clients that relies on this service has that high priority. So you can give a lot of, get a lot of interference, especially on systems with multiple tenants executing on them. Um, with this type of assignment. Now, a big downside with kind of a, at least a straw man version of this, the original L4 was effectively that you could have a denial of service on the limited service uh, server budget. So if one of these clients were to invoke the service a lot, then that service might run out of budget and that could cause another client to make a request and for that service to not actually get that service because the server was out of budget. So you can actually create DOSs within the system. Now, low priority assignment is another option, of course. So you choose the priority of the server to be the floor of any of the priorities of any of the clients or somewhere in between. Um, I think it's uh, somewhat obvious that this is not a good decision because you can have easily have unbounded priority inversion within the system. A third, uh, 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 a thread not shown here could be at a middle priority above that of the server, but below that of the clients. And it, if executing infinitely, could prevent the execution of any of the clients as they wait for the server that is blocked because of the, the interference. So this has been demonstrated to not generate predictable systems. So you have to be very, very careful when you're assigning the prioritization of the system. And the accounting is a little touch and go when you want efficiency. So when you want efficiency, uh, the original Lika L4 kind of said that you really want to avoid scheduling on the fast path and most L4 variants maintain these types of properties. So you want to do lazy scheduling within the system by um, doing scheduling only when you have preemptions, timer ticks, interrupts, etc. Not when you're doing synchronous IPC between threads. And you want to do time slice donation as well in the original version of the, the L4 system. So the whole idea here is that if we're executing it in the client on the right, that's why it's bolded and it makes an invocation to the server and therefore the server is executing on its behalf, then the server is executing using the priority and budget of that client. However, once a timer tick comes in, then you update the priority and budget to be that of the service. So though this is trying to kind of uh, sidestep that problem of the um, uh, denial of service attack, it just is adding a huge amount of non-determinism because you don't know when the tick is going to happen, therefore which budget is going to get um, expended at any point in time. So this is not a good idea for predictable systems. Another challenge within a lot of these systems is effectively the ordering of wait queues. You can have a system whereby the, the low priority client on the right has made an invocation to the middle server. And if that server either executes at a low priority or it blocks on one of the kernel's blocking APIs, then you might switch to another thread. When you switch to another thread, let's imagine that there are at least three middle priority threads in the system, and they all make requests to that same endpoint um, within the system or or to another endpoint that somebody that um, another server thread is not necessarily waiting on at this point in time so they will get added to the wait queue it's typically a queue to maintain um, some progress guarantees so that you don't have starvation um, and at that point let's imagine that a high priority thread then actually tries to join that same queue because they're typically sorted as FIFO you're going to end up with something like this where the 
um, client on the left is going to be the first client service. So the middle priority will be service before the high priority. So you're going to have three instances of the server executing through middle priority tasks before you finally are able to get to that high priority task. So this causes a uh, amount of priority inversion within the system where you're doing computation for low priority things when a high priority thing really should be being serviced if possible. Um, and it could be unbounded in this case because you could have virtually an unbounded number of these middle priority tasks that queue up to cause that interference. So this can cause complete unpredictability within the system if you can have unbounded priority inversion. So this is all motivated by effectively wanting a very fast IPC path. You want O of 1 operations to maintain the queues so that you don't have to pay the O of N costs. Um, but that's what essentially causes this inversion. Managing it as a queue doesn't really work. Managing it as a stack actually is sounds a little crazy, but it actually maintains the priority ordering that you want until there are blocks or preemptions that kind of come into the, the system. Um, so a queue is generally a good idea, but you really want to make it priority aware if you want to avoid this inversion, right? So you could do this in O of N time by, ma by maintaining the same simple code path, so probably having minimal impact on the verification. Um, or you could use a O of 1 type queues where you're basically using the array 1 per priority. Now you're using a lot of memory for each of the endpoints and it starts to become more complex. Or you could use some sort of a balanced tree for each of the nodes so that you have log n guarantees. But for the O of n and the log n, you know, you you have complex queues, it's gonna be harder to verify this code. And you're gonna to have to be able to insert preemption points in there if you have a non-preemptive system. So it starts to get a little complicated. Um, and certainly uh, systems don't do it right now. So you have to be aware that this inversion can happen and essentially accommodate it. Now, there are different ways to work with priority within the system. And I'm going to be talking about Fiasco and uh, Nova in this case. Fiasco came up with Credo, and it was subsequently essentially refined by Nova. And the high-level idea here is that they decouple the scheduling context from the execution context. So each of the threads within the system has a given execution context, a, a register set and a stack and a protection domain, all of that. But the scheduling context is a priority and budget, and that actually goes along with invocations in a somewhat complicated way. So if we have a client on the right that makes an invocation to a server, then it will start executing in that server and that server will execute with a priority and budget of that client. And if it makes another invocation, then subsequently that lower server will maintain that priority and budget of the client. And this is guaranteed, it's deterministic, it's not doing the at tick do different things. So what happens is that at a tick, you do need to figure out which budget you're using, and at that point you just simply follow the dependencies to find it. Which priority you use is actually not straightforward, though. Which priority you use is a little bit more complicated. Let's assume that a high priority thread wakes up and makes an invocation to the uh, middle service. Now, of course, because that middle service is computing for the um, low priority child, the low priority, low priority client, um, it will have to block on the NQ. And what Credo does is something really intelligent. It will track all of the priorities back through all of these dependencies and try to inherit the high pri highest priority of any of the awaiting threads or um, active clients. So this is essentially doing priority and budget inheritance, but the priority is coming from the maximum priority along that path, and the budget is coming from the client on which computation is being done. So this has a number of benefits. It maintains the lazy scheduling within the system, which maintains efficiency, which is amazing, um, which is necessary for L4 variants, I think is deep within the, the DNA. Um, and it keeps the priority of all of the dependencies along the path and the budget of the client. Downsides are effectively that preemptions require pointing, pointer chasing through all these dependencies, which can be O of N in the length of this dependency structure. So if you do not control the IPC topology of the system, then this can be effectively unbounded. So you need to, if you're doing this in something like cell 4 that's non-preemptive, figure out a way to do it with uh, preemption points and whatnot. So it becomes really complicated um, but it's a really interesting idea and it's been shown to work within L4 variants quite well.
Um, it does have the downside of adding a lot of policy into the kernel. You're putting all of these inheritance rules and whatnot into the kernel, but if this is the policy that you need, then you don't really care. If it is not, then you might have some issues. So for instance, doing um, original PCP is uh, uh, very difficult to do within the system. One of the big downsides of the system is running out of the budget in the server. If you're doing computation on behalf of a client and you run out of the budget within the server, what do you do? Because you don't want the server to just stop computation because it might be blocking high priority threads awaiting its computation somewhere in the dependency chain, right? So there were no great solutions to this that I knew within those original papers. Um, Fiasco kind of took the notion of a scheduling context and generalized it a little bit where you could have many threads that multiplex a smaller number of scheduling contexts um, that can, you know, be many of them per core. Um, and this ended up being a really useful um, way to think about computation and about um, capturing priority and budget. Um, they also were using, as far as I can tell, deferrable servers um, for their budget. So this is a, a predictable way to do periods and replenishments um, using deferrable servers. So their, their budgets and scheduling contexts are really quite useful and use a lot of those policies that I talked about. Now, Cell 4 also did some innovation in the space that was really interesting with the mixed criticality extension, which I'm going to call the MCS extensions. So the whole idea here is that similar to what we saw for the Fiasco case, the Credo case, you are doing inheritance, but it's of budgets. So what you see here is the client on the right that invokes a server, that invokes a server prime. Um, and it passes along its budget effectively. You maintain execution within that budget as you traverse through the system. Um, so the computation within servers is done using that budget. This is, of course, optional. It has to be a passive server um, to be able to do this, but it's an option. And then if a high priority client then wants to be able to use the, the server, then you know, you're going to end up using its budget instead of the... Um, the servers, right? So you're, you're basically inheriting the budget as you go. So this was based on sporadic servers, which are a way to essentially rate limit execution within the system. You can get n amounts of computation over some larger window of m, of size m, and it provides those guarantees over a sliding window, whereas the deferrable servers from Fiasco only provide it over a fixed window. Um, so there's a little bit of generalization here, but it also adds a fair amount of complexity because the sporadic servers need to be sized with a lot of consideration in the system. Um, it, they basically need to be sized according to how many preemptions can happen in the system, which is something that's hard to bound or know in a lot of different systems. Um, however, one of the really cool things that are provided by the MCS extensions is timeout exceptions. And the whole idea here is that when a budget is expended, it can be programmed to cause an exception that can be handled by a separate thread within the system. So now the semantics around what should happen when a server that was executing on a client's budget um, runs out of that budget, you can actually program different solutions for that. So this is a really, really cool extension that provides some foundations for um, user level policy definition around that. And it was actually shown to be really useful because it could provide a limited form of user level scheduling. So you could think of a number of processes invoking a single scheduler using blocking IPC, and that scheduler can interpret those in invocations as effectively cooperative switches between threads. So when they want to block, they can invoke a scheduler process and effectively say, I'm done executing. And the scheduler can effectively not return to them immediately, and that keeps them blocked. Instead, it can return to another thread, which is effectively a context switch. And it uses the timeout exceptions and the budgets to effectively allow those different clients to execute for a limited amount of time. When their budget is expended, then the scheduler receives a timeout exception, which allows it to advance the time slice and switch over to another client. However, this is not a general solution for user-level scheduling, as far as I can tell, because if any of those components blocks on an API that the scheduler is not interposing on, 
then you effectively have um, the scheduler out of the loop of really the important part is when one of those threads wakes up. So the scheduler won't know when the thread wakes up and won't know when to run it again. So this is where the blocking semantics provided by the kernel APIs get in the way of being able to provide what you want to be the blocking semantics provided by a user level scheduler. So this is a good attempt to provide a limited form of user level scheduling, but I do not believe it generalizes to kind of a full system doing scheduling. Um, so the benefits of LAM CS extension is that you completely avoid the denial of service attack on servers because you are effectively using the budgets of the clients. And you effectively solve the problems that were intrinsic in some of the other budget systems because of the timer exceptions that you can have. When one of these clients runs out of budget, you can programmatically figure out how you want to resolve that. <clears throat> Downsides are that the you still maintain all the prioritization challenges because all of these inheritances are not for priorities. So you effectively, uh, most sane systems that I've seen use priority ceiling, which means all of the kind of um, inefficiencies that come from that, the pessimism that comes from using priority ceiling for all of these resources in the system. And that becomes particularly pronounced when any of these services are very expensive to execute in, right? If they're cheap, it doesn't really matter. You also need to be very careful in how you use the sporadic servers. I alluded to this. I'm not going to go into it in detail because um, it's rather complicated. But if you want them to be predictable, you need to put a bound on how many preemptions there can be of a given thread. And that's a difficult thing to do. And it additionally implies some overhead within the kernel for doing things like sorting timeouts, which um, is not something that you necessarily had to do before. Um, and it's not super general because you can't provide user level scheduling with blocking APIs for the rest of the system, but I think it's amazing that you can actually have a system that can provide some facilities for user level scheduling regardless. <clears throat> Okay, so how can we address the priority issues within um, the system, right? You need to do this by design in some way. And I'm going to talk about this in two different ways. One is if we're maintaining the verification of the current system. Um, and I think many people have really gotten to use self or will kind of identify with these types of things. But first, if we want to maintain verification, every server must have a priority ceiling assigned um, priority and really should not block. Um, and if it invokes another server, that server should not block, right? So this is an end-to-end -end problem. You're now kind of making your execution be dependent on all of the servers that you invoke within the chain. Um, but it's, you know, a reasonable way to design the system given the constraints. Another way to do it is if you have separate server threads within the service and separate endpoints for each of those clients. Um, that is one way to kind of get rid of the wait queue type prioritization issues. But the issue there is, of course, that, you know, if you're doing verification of those services, that's really hard if they're multi-threaded. And the other option, which I think is one of the most common options, is simply don't have shared services that are really invoked. So essentially do partitioning. And for a lot of VMMs, this is the effective solution, right? Uh, you have a virtual machine that leverages a VMM, and you don't necessarily have that many shared services, and certainly not a long depth of transitively um, relied upon on services. So additionally, if you can modify the system and you don't care about the verification or we can take the verification to the next level, then including the um, credo style priority inheritance plus budget inheritance while adding on the endpoint queue sorting, I think now you have kind of the ideal predictable system given that execution model of synchronization between different threads. <clears throat> Okay, so we've looked at kind of going through the spectrum towards thread migration. Now let's actually see what thread migration actually is. There are a couple of seminal papers that introduce this. Um, and the general idea is that if you have a client thread and it wishes to invoke a server and that invokes another server, the same logical execution and the same logical schedulable entity executes through all of the components. Now it will have different execution contexts, different register sets, different stacks, different protection domains, but the schedulable entity, the thread, does not change throughout the system. 
So there are a number of systems that executed this. I'm gonna that implemented this. I'm gonna provide a number of citations. Um, one of the challenges is how you actually provide these user level stacks. And there are ways to do that. You can imagine that if you have multiple clients invoking a shared service, you're gonna have to have multiple stacks within those services, um, or some way to limit the number of stacks, but then have exceptional conditions. And that's talked about in this publication. Um, one of the benefits of this is that we don't need to define blocking semantics within the kernel. The kernel no longer has blocking system calls, and instead, a scheduler at user level defines all of those blocking system calls through its own APIs. So if a thread wants to block, it needs to invoke the scheduler. The scheduler has the ability to dispatch between threads. So that is effectively how it blocks threads. It maintains its own run queue, it maintains its own block queues um, as data structures as per norm and it dispatches between threads as such. So it actually maintains its own budgets, its own priorities, however it wants to. If it's EDF, fine. If, if it's sporadic server, deferrable server, fine. It's user level code, it can do whatever it wants. It also maintains some access to timer ticks. It needs to because, hey, it's a scheduler. So it has a way to interact with timer ticks within the system. And a big challenge in these systems is figuring out how to deal with the interrupts, right? If a network interface card has an interrupt that activates a thread for a device driver or something, uh, you really don't want to invoke the scheduler for every interrupt. So there need to be very intelligent ways to get around that. And a lot of work um, has been done in that. <clears throat> now, just moving the scheduler to user level is not in and of itself a, like a super useful thing because having one scheduler in the kernel, one scheduler in the user isn't that beneficial. However, being able to have a multitude of schedulers that coordinate to create the temporal semantics of the system and the temporal isolation semantics of the system, that is useful. So there are temporal capabilities that allow schedulers to effectively interact in a way where they don't necessarily need to trust each other, but they can pass time between each other. So thread migration effectively removes the blocking semantics of the system and allows you to implement a lot of policies in user level, but I think an intuition is that it has to be relatively slow. Um, but we've shown that dispatch latency between um, different threads within schedulers can be virtually free on the order of 41 cycles. So user level scheduling dispatching is absolutely not um, too slow. And we actually showed on a small microcontroller running at 200 megahertz, you know, with 256 kilobytes of RAM um, that you could still get really good execution properties. Um, you do have to make IPC invocations on every single, um, uh, to talk to the scheduler for blocking semantics. So is this fast enough? It doesn't have the pedigree of synchronous RPC between threads. On x86 and on uh, Cortex A9, we find that IPC is about 20% faster than the fast path of cell four. Um, so we think that, you know, that's, that's pretty decent. <clears throat> Downsides, though, are pretty significant, and that's that you have concurrency by default in different servers. You have multiple stacks, multiple threads executing in every server, so the big question here is whether this is completely incompatible with formal verification. Um, it does require predictable locks for those threads to coordinate within a different service um, and blocking IPC to the scheduler. So we've worked through a lot of these issues, but there still is work to be done. Um, now, if cell four wanted to actually do full user level scheduling, then it needs to know when blocking and wake ups happen for different threads within the system. And there is work that has already been done towards this. Jan Stros um, did this in 07. The downside is that it has a significant impact on IPC and on some other operations. Now, another non-functional concern we really care about is scalability. So for scalability, we have the significant issue that if we have different coordination patterns between um, threads on different cores, how much can interference from the kernel impact the execution of each of those computations. That could be because there are locks within the kernel that slow down computation on one core because of lock held on another, or it could be because of IPIs traversing between the systems. And 
uh, the one version of cell four, of course, uses a global lock within the kernel. So it has predictable linear increases on the left as you increase the number of cores interfering on a single um, IPC call. Um, so we didn't try to use like a worst case path to try to generate interference. We just did yields and calls to see if we could um, increase the overhead of a IPC. And that's bad, right? Your IPC, you want to have a good worst case value. This shows that you can push it up on another core, which also shows that that interference can be used to compromise confidentiality between the systems as you can pass bits using this type of interference from the global lock. Linux, of course, has many more problems, which I'm not going to go into. Um, there are ways to get around this. One of them is that you have no locks in the kernel. So lock-free systems have been kind of investigated for a long time. Fiasco started along this path and Composite showed that you could actually have an entirely weight-free kernel. Um, that is, it could have global progress guarantees for all cores and all applications. Whereas Barrelfish looked at a multi-kernel type architecture. And that was actually kind of, I think, what was adopted in some versions of Cell 4. And I think that's really quite reasonable, but multi-kernels always add the question of how you coordinate between the cores. And if that uses IPIs, you can see the, the um, reference paper that that can be a hard thing to get right. So cell four is a fantastic system that provides a lot of functional guarantees, um, but it requires very careful design in terms of its end-to-end -end IPC to get predictability. You have to carefully prioritize, you have to partition to avoid the wait queue type things, um, type interference, and you need careful control of the sporadic servers to avoid the complexities within the kernel and for preemptions. For predictability, you either have to run it on a single core or um, use some other strategy for that. And all these things have some utilization loss, which as far as I know, has not been studied in depth. So I appreciate your time. I um, hope that we have a good discussion about this. Thank you very much.